Tom Cruise has good reason to be pretty happy with the way his life has turned out. I'm really proud to have made the films that I've made and the choices and the people that I've worked with, uh, the times that I've had, and, and I think I've, I guess I've, I've never taken for granted uh, the opportunities. Things didn't get off to such a great start for the boy from Syracuse in New York who was bullied in school and suffered learning difficulties. You know, I was diagnosed with being dyslexic and I, had a, I really had a hell of a time learning. A hell of a time. It was very difficult. But as he began trying to build a career as an actor, he found innovative ways of getting round his condition. As successful as I was, I, I always saw the mountain. I knew there was a limit to how, what I could do with, with my life. But that attitude changed when he was cast in the Generation X classic Risky Business, which immediately catapulted Thomas Cruise Maypole III into the upper echelons of Hollywood's A-list. And he's remained there ever since. Perhaps one of the secrets to his enduring success lies in his deep commitment to every project he undertakes. I've always felt responsible that if I'm going to make a movie, I want I want everybody to win. You know, I want the actors to win. I want the studio to win. I want it. That's that's always my hope. And that attitude has paid incredible dividends. Since breaking the seal with Top Gun in 1986, only six of his films have failed to bring in more than $100 million at the box office. After 20 years at the top, Tom proved he was still Hollywood's biggest box office star in 2006 by pulling in a massive paycheck of $100 million for just one film. The $100 million figure for Tom Cruise, that's from War of the Worlds. And Tom Cruise is such a huge star these days that not only does he make a really nice salary up front, but he also gets a big portion of the profits of the movies he makes. So because War of the Worlds did so well, he made about $100 million from that movie alone. Not that Tom would say it's ever been about the money. You know, when you look at the career, I've always played very different characters. You know, they've all, uh, they've all been very different from Taps to Rain Man, Born on the Fourth of July, uh, Interview with a Vampire. I've always, you know, for me personally, I, I want a challenge. So I felt, you know, I really feel, I mean, definitely, you know, each one, some of them are extremely different, uh, but yeah, I'm always looking for that. I'm always looking for a challenge. Back in 1996, he was on a mission to prove himself as a bona fide action star in the first installment of the Mission Impossible franchise. It's a picture that you go back the second time, and I appreciate even more that you know, I've seen it probably about uh, 15, 20 times now. But, uh, that's the kind of movie that I wanted to make with this. It's something that, you know, we're very uh, careful in designing the picture in every shot so that it's, you know, when you see it again, you see how everything makes sense. The same year, his transformation from cold-blooded sports agent to loving husband and friend in Jerry Maguire earned him his first Oscar nomination. Uh, I don't know. I really have no idea about that. I just, I, I love making movies and everything else is, you know, kind of happens. But it's nice to be nominated. It's always a lot of fun. At the London premiere of the film, his wife was just happy that there were plenty of distractions to keep Tom's mind off the big night. Well, it's actually good because we're over here and we're not caught up in any of the hype and we're just working and it sort of is, um, keeps you very grounded, you know. So uh, he's just, he's so concentrated on what he's doing now that that almost seems so far away. In the end, he lost out to Jeffrey Rush for his performance as David Helfgott in Shine. Tom scored another nomination two years later for his supporting role as a misogynist motivational speaker in Magnolia. But his biggest challenge in the lead up to the new millennium was undoubtedly starring alongside Nicole in Stanley Kubrick's last film, Eyes Wide Shut. And, uh, to have the opportunity to work with him uh, just alone was unbelievable to me. And then to be able to share that with my wife and have the two of us go through this experience together is something that uh, I will carry on for the rest of, of my life it, it, as a dream that, uh, that came true.
working with the director of classics like A Clockwork Orange and The Shining, who gained a reputation for putting his actors through the mill, turned out to be as much pleasure as pain. You know, when you're working with him, uh, it, it, it really wasn't convoluted or complex necessarily, you know, in terms of, of his communication, but he was, he, he was incredibly uh, intelligent and he was not at all pretentious about it. He didn't uh, try to, you know, throw it in your face. He was uh, very down to earth. The film's theme of sexual obsession and depictions of orgies led to heavy censorship in the US but made it the most hotly anticipated film of the year. This is very exciting for me to be here tonight and uh, to be able to share this picture with you. In 2001, after his divorce from Nicole Kidman, Tom promoted Vanilla Sky, the film that had introduced him to his next real-life romantic partner, Penelope Cruz. By now, he'd become such a bankable star that he was commanding a huge percentage of his film's profits on top of his $20 million salary. 2002 brought Hollywood's biggest box office star and most successful director together for the first time. To create a big screen interpretation of the Philip K. Dick short story, The Minority Report. As film lovers salivated at the prospect of a Spielberg Cruise collaboration, Tom's enthusiasm only heightened the excitement. He's amazing. Uh, he's, you know, what, what, what else can I say that hasn't been said about Stephen? But having had the, you know, known him as a friend and then having that opportunity to work with him as a director and have him direct me, uh, I can say every day was <clears throat> a lot of fun. It was uh, exciting and surprising. Uh, He's just a master storyteller. The blockbusting sci-fi thriller set in 2054 depicted a Washington, D.C. where murder has been eliminated. Thanks to the visions of three psychic beings who can accurately predict when a murder is about to be committed. On the strength of their evidence, the guilty are caught, convicted and punished before they can commit the crime. Tom was blown away with the film's vision of the future. It's exciting and it's something that, you know, in some ways a warning uh, to society and, and but also, you know, to be able to embrace the potential of, of what, what we're capable of doing. The enormous scope of the $140 million film, which introduced viewers to technologies that have since been developed in the real world, required incredible commitment from everyone involved. And Stephen was deeply impressed with his star's focus. I like working with a great partner who understood every aspect of the movie I wanted to make and who supported me in it and who gave me so much of himself as an actor. He just gave me everything he had as an actor and, and, and whenever I needed it, he was there for me. And he's, and, and, but he was there for me 50 years as my friend. It was great that that friendship leaked into the movie and became part of why He's so good in the film. Swamped by fans at the London premiere of the movie, Tom remained as touched as ever by their devotion. I don't ever expect it, and when it happens, it's, it's really lovely. My, my days aren't like this every day. I don't wake up and you know, go to work. It's not like this all day, so it's fun. In fact, Tom is well known for his graciousness taking the time to work the long lines of fans who have queued for hours for autographs. For me, I, I look at people come out to say hello to me and and, and all these bad manners not to say hello, but it's something that I enjoy. These people come out and say, hey, they're just so warm. How can you not want to go and say hello? I, I like people. In 2004, the culture he was privileged to explore was that of 19th century Japan for his film The Last Samurai in which he played an American captain who becomes immersed in the spirit of ancient samurai. The role called for some very rigorous preparation. I trained for eight months prior to shooting the film, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have these guys who were very generous with me and helped me. Both of them are, you know, he's incredibly athletic. And uh, I ended up, uh, I put on 20 pounds for the movie, 
for the character and also to be able to carry the swords but and I to wear the armor. But I had to change my whole body, which it was, it was great because as I was developing the character and learning uh, and studying, mm. uh, my body was changing mm. and I was becoming more and more the character of Algren. Mm. His extraordinary dedication to the role earned him a Golden Globe nomination and great respect from the film's director, Edward Zwick. Everything that, that, that he gets in terms of the the attention is, is deserved because when you work as hard as he does and he's committed for two years to this and, and it was a commitment that was physical and emotional and, and, and very intense. So so obviously I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for him. Then after playing an assassin in the Michael Mann thriller Collateral, it was straight down to the business of bringing H.G. Wells' classic novel War of the Worlds to the big screen with his old buddy and Minority Report collaborator Steven Spielberg. <laughs> Despite the scale of War of the Worlds, Stephen's decision to tell the apocalyptic tale from the point of view of one family made it intensely personal. We always thought of it as the smallest, biggest one because it's this epic scope, but it's really about this family and the journey of this family. And it's told from a subjective point of view. Uh, so it's, it, it's a, an incredibly engaging film. Audiences agreed. War of the Worlds, which also starred 11-year-old Dakota Fanning as Tom's daughter, went on to earn nearly $600 million at the box office. It served as a great warm-up to the reprisal of perhaps the most famous role of Tom's career, that of Ethan Hunt in the hugely successful Mission Impossible franchise. The third installment, which brought J.J. Abrams on board as director, was largely shot in Shanghai. As usual, Tom insisted on doing all of the film's stunts himself. These stunts I trained specifically for this movie. When I was doing War of the Worlds, when I was shooting War of the Worlds, I was training for Mission 3. Wow, that early? You had, you had to. I've mm -hmm. been training over a year for some of the stunts that I had to do. That's unbelievable. Even when you see the stunt in Shitang, I mean, there's a jump that I had to make. It was about, it was about an eight-foot jump yeah. under mm -hmm. a little railing and I had to land like that you know if you turn an ankle or you know you could break your knee right you know, right wow the water just wouldn't have been good he got to take a well-earned break from danger in his next role as a Republican senator in the terrorist drama line for lambs in 2007 and gave Tom the chance to work with two legends of cinema you're gonna walk away with your interpretation it's a picture about raising awareness and raising responsibility and it's also, for me as an actor, you know, I get to work with Robert Redford and be directed by Robert Redford and work with Meryl Streep. He also had a great time on the set of his next film, a Ben Stiller comedy that also starred Jack Black and Robert Downey Jr. Tropic Thunder gave Tom the chance to let his hair down and play a hot-headed studio executive, complete with fat suit, bald head and fake hands before focusing on the task of playing the leader of a failed plot to kill Adolf Hitler during World War II. But despite the serious nature of the subject matter in The Valkyrie, his co-stars insisted Tom was plenty of fun on set. I mean, I had a lot of fun with him. We had a few dancing lessons and I, and I couldn't stop laughing. I pissed my pants, like, almost. I, I mean, really... You know, in the, I'm just, I mean, I have a big mouth now, but when I first met him, I blushed like for two minutes non-stop. It was really, it came from my neck. It was not, not charming anymore, but he took it all away. He was really, really the sweetest, most supportive colleague you could think of. Uh, well, I mean, he's, he's, he's modest in, in, in that regard. I mean, but so am I. But I mean, he certainly likes company. He's a very gregarious guy. Since then, he's thrown himself back into the action with rom-com queen Cameron Diaz in Night and Day. And according to critics, he's got a few more action man roles left in him yet. There will be a time where he doesn't look as boyish and youthful as he does now, and where he'll have to start considering taking roles that are a little bit more middle-aged man roles. I think he is lucky. He's got a couple more years before he has to worry about that. <laughs> While Tom's films have been raking in the big bucks at the box office, the gossip magazines have been selling millions of copies off the back of his private life. His 1987 marriage to actress Mimi Rogers 
has been well documented, not least because of the belief that it was Mimi who first introduced him to Scientology. However, it came as a shock to many celebrity watchers when a 61-year-old Cher declared on the Oprah Winfrey show in 2008 that she had had a secret romance with Tom in the mid-1980s. Describing him as the most adorable man you can imagine, she remembered him as a very private person. They reportedly split up when Tom went to Chicago to film The Color of Money in 1985. And within two years, he'd married Mimi. Having just starred in Someone to Watch Over Me opposite Tom Berenger, Mimi was making something of a name for herself. But she couldn't compete with the meteoric rise of her husband, who was fast becoming the hottest property in Hollywood. By 1990, it appeared that Tom may have been plowing all of his sexual energy into his career. Mimi has allegedly since claimed that they split because of Tom's desire to become celibate in order to preserve the purity of his instrument. Whether he maintained that purity after meeting Nicole Kidman on the set of their film Days of Thunder later in the year is a matter of conjecture. Either way, he ended up marrying the Australian actress on Christmas Eve of 1990, ten months after his divorce from Mimi. They went on to enjoy a decade-long reign as Hollywood's number one power couple regularly appearing at each other's premieres. For the two of us, we're both very supportive of each other, so you really get excited when, uh, when the other one is doing something that they love doing. Despite all the kissing and hand-holding, they had to endure endless speculation about the legitimacy of their relationship and Tom's sexuality. The fact that their two children, Connor and Isabella, were adopted did nothing to quell the rumours. Tom and Nicole's attempts to stop tongues wagging resulted in a libel case against a British tabloid that claimed their marriage was a sham to cover up his, and quite possibly her, homosexuality. They won the case and were awarded around £100,000 each in damages. After years of rumours and gossip, when they starred together in the 1999 erotic thriller Eyes Wide Shut, audiences couldn't wait to see for themselves whether they exuded any heat between the sheets. In the end, it was hard to say, because although the film in which they played husband and wife was about sex, it wasn't intended to be sexy in its exploration of their characters' sexual dysfunctions. I mean, the film is about sex, but it's about so many other things as well, and I think that it uh, it got blown out of proportion, actually. The, the, uh, well, there's sex in the it. I don't necessarily think it's movie. about sex. It's about, about some sexual obsession and relationships and, uh, you know, the dynamic of marriage. and. Uh, it turned out to be a moot point anyway. As another year later, just 10 days before their 10th anniversary, came the surprise announcement that Tom was divorcing Nicole. And while Nicole was reportedly still reeling from the shock of the sudden split, Tom had already moved on to his next high-profile relationship with his Vanilla Sky co-star Penelope Cruz. Despite their conflicting work schedules, Tom was determined to remain in constant close contact with the Spanish actress. I mean, we're not away from each other that much, you know. There's there's moments, uh, you know, a couple weeks here and there, but you know, I have kids and family, and you know, there's a telephone and there's fax, and it's uh, it's really wonderful, actually. New to the international spotlight, poor Penelope was finding all the scrutiny of her love life rather overwhelming. You can find a way to protect yourself and to have your private life, and without that, you have nothing. So, of course, you manage and find a way, and sometimes it's difficult, but you, you can do it. When the end of the line came in early 2004, Tom's publicist claimed that the relationship had simply run its course and that they were still good friends. That left Tom on the hunt for his next red carpet romance. 
By the time it arrived in the shape of Dawson Creek starlet Katie Holmes, Tom had lost all semblance of the private person Cher had fallen for 20 years earlier. Something magnificent has happened to me, and uh, something extraordinary, and it's something that uh, I'm so happy I can't restrain myself. <laughs> so I feel, <laughs> you know, she's really an extraordinary woman, and I'm really really happy. Within a year, Katie had given birth to Tom's first natural child, Suri, and they were married before an A-list encrusted crowd outside Rome. Since then, Tom has been sticking as close to Katie as their nickname Tomcat suggests. On her 30th birthday, he was preparing to leap up on stage after her performance in the Broadway play All My Sons and surprise her with a birthday cake. So I set up, I also worked out with John Lithgow and the cast. They're going to come on tonight and get the whole audience to sing her happy birthday. And I had this, ordered this, another cake for her tonight. So they're going to bring that on stage. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's fun. While some gossip columnists have labeled Tom's close attentions touching, others have painted him as a controlling husband, determined to indoctrinate Katie into his beloved religion of Scientology. In his unauthorized biography, Andrew Morton comments on how he believes Katie has changed since marrying Tom. Interviewers who remember her for this bright, sparky, clear-eyed uh, girl now t call her dead-eyed Katie. Months before, she was, you know, she was just an ordinary, aspiring actress, and here she was a few months later, standing up and joining in wild applause with the rest of the Scientologists as they hailed the destruction by bombs and grenades of psychiatry. It wasn't the first time that Tom's allegiance to the church, founded by sci-fi writer L. Ron Hubbard in 1954, had come under fire. In 2005, controversy erupted after Tom publicly criticized his Endless Love co-star Brooke Shields for taking and promoting the use of Paxil to cope with postnatal depression. After a war of words in the media, Tom reportedly apologized and invited Brooke to his wedding to Katie the following year. But with rumors continuing to fly about Tom's religious beliefs and the state of his marriage, Katie very wisely decided to pay no attention to media gossip. I don't read much of that stuff because it's, it's not my life. You know, I'm, I'm concentrating on, on my life, and, and I've, I've never been happier. It's wonderful. And of course, after 25 years in the spotlight, her husband has long since learned to turn a blind eye to what is written about him in the press. No, you know what, I just, you just look at it, and, and when they go far off, then you sue, and, you know, just certain things you just, you don't pay attention to, and... Uh, you know, mostly you just you just have to go on and live your life. You can't give can't give it too much attention. And uh, you know, what else? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> We're here. We love you know what we do. We love films. We love you know and feel privileged to be doing something that we enjoy doing. And uh, so the other stuff you just just can't give it too much credence.